little dotted lines where the decoration has been worn away here and here. And what's worn away the decoration in those places? Yes. The harper who played the Queen Mary harp in the old tradition. We think, how exciting. That's the wear marks. And yet, it also shows us where the harper put their hands. Okay? And that's kind of interesting. And the Trinity College harp is the same, except the wear mark is much more obvious. You can see it very clearly here, the way it's gouged away, scooped away. Can you see that? And you can imagine sitting behind the harp, with your left hand moving that one and your right hand there. And I'm not the first person to think of doing this. Um, in the 1960s, the Trinity College Hub was sent to the British Museum to be repaired and restored. And Mary Rowland was asked to play it. To play it on the Trinity College Hub. I mean, you wouldn't get that nowadays. But she wrote up what she thought. She said, the first time this harp was handled by me, it became immediately apparent that the deep wear marks on the sound box give absolute indication as to the way it was held, i.e. on the left shoulder, with the left hand playing the treble strings and the right hand in the bass. This is the reverse order to all modern harps, including her own practice, which are placed on the right shoulder, the right hand playing above the left as a general rule, etc., etc. This is not so with the Trinity College harp, for the depth of the wear marks also indicate that the harp had been held in position on its keel by the arms or wrists while playing, thus giving each hand only a limited range of action. Only in a kneeling position, or when sitting on a low stool with the harp standing on the floor, was it possible to fit the arms into the wear marks. She, she, she was doing this, she was there, sitting on the floor with the Trinity College harp, putting her in wrists into the wear marks. Isn't that amazing, that, that visceral experience? There she is, with it. So the left hand picture shows her, it, she explains, details in the position of the hands and the way this harp was played. This was proved by the wear marks made by the arms on the sandbox. So she's put her wrist onto the harp where it's worn away. And then that's where her fingers touch the strings. And here she is with the harp on the floor, sort of kneeling, I think. And here's one knee up to support the sandbox and the other knee down to support her and her wrists placed in there. So she was doing this as a kind of experiential experiment to find out how the harp worked. And this gave her insight into the way it was played. Now one thing that she didn't talk about is the wear marks on the bottom of the harp. Now it's very difficult to see. This, when the harp was rebuilt, all of this completely worm-eaten stuff was repaired for display. And so all this smooth area is all modern filler to build up the harp, and then the wooden parts at the side. You can see shiny filler. But you can see that there's wear on the corners, and it seems to be more on this side than on this side. And if you look at it closer, you can see this is the harp the other way around, looking from behind it. On the right-hand side, here's the original wood of the harp. And then here it's eaten away up to the middle. And on the left-hand side, here this is the filler all the way to the corner. So the left-hand corner is completely gone, but the right-hand corner is quite well preserved. And I started thinking, why is that? What? If it's the if they're sitting there, think of with the harp. And then the Queen Mary harp has the same thing. With the left-hand corner worn away a little triangle, and the triangle where away lines up with the foot. So do we have a volunteer to pick up the Queen Mary? Yeah, come on, Rachel, show us. <laughs> <laughs> So the heart balances on its corner. Can everyone see that? Anybody else want a quick go? To try this, just sit at the heart and hold it. Anybody who wants to go can come down and do it right now. Two people max. <laughs> because we've got to do lots of this and we can't have everyone to go. We'll be here until midnight. So very quickly. It's one thing to see it, but do you, do you feel the way it balances on its corner? Yeah. Yes. 
So we have to think, what's, it, what, what's about sitting on the floor? Mary Rowland talks about a low stool. Look, at, look around the room, all the chairs are the same height, but we can't assume that in medieval times that was the case. So do, would they sit on the floor to play the part? It kind of works, but are there other possibilities? You have to think about this, you have to experiment, you have to try. But then you can learn about possibilities of how the heart might be held and played. But I think Mary Rowland is the first person I've come across who actually did this work. And she, that's brilliant that she thought of doing this. So you can see there's a lot of evidence for the medieval Gaelic harp performance practice that comes out of the instrument. Even though we have no written music, we have no actual repertory for that instrument, but we can start to say quite concrete things about how the harp was played. And I find that very interesting as a starting point to think about performance practice. Okay, I found, I found this page. There's a copy in the Historical Harp Society Library, but you can't look at it because it's in its cataloging frozen state. But this is um, the International Council of Musical Instrument Museums in one of their publications. And they had a whole issue devoted to copies of instruments. Because, and why, I mean, you know, Mary Rowland, it's all right for her, she can go into Trinity College and she can handle and sit and put the Trinity College harp on the floor and sit at it. But we can't do that. They won't let us. It's very unfair, mm -hmm. but that's the way the world is. And so so we so we have we have the idea that, oh well you could get a copy of the harp instead of having to handle the real thing. So these museum people talk about different types of object. And, and I like I'm interested in this list. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I like the way that a museum professional dealing with historical musical instruments is starting to think that there's different kinds of things. And so they list, number one, the historical object. That's the thing you see when you go into the museum store, and it's there on the shelf with its label, and you're not allowed to touch it. Okay. Number two, the modern type, or usually called a reproduction. This category covers those instruments of which the instrument maker has knowingly departed from details of the historic object. So this is quite an interesting idea, that you can make something that is kind of similar to the real thing, but the maker changes it. But, and then it can be done for all kinds of reasons, to make it cheaper, to make it look more modern, to make it easier to make. There's any number of reasons why you might do that. And some of them are good reasons, and some of them are less good reasons, depending on what you want. <coughs> So it's an interesting idea, and, and, I, and I'm not sure I agree, like I said, I'm not sure I agree with these categories, but I just, I'm interested in the thought process. Number three, the reconstruction, and it's kind of speculative, that you do your research, and you do a speculative reconstruction, and you make a new instrument that kind of is the, is the original in a different state, like if you have a broken instrument, you make it as it was before it was broken. If you have a harp that's missing some parts, you kind of invent things to fit in the parts. So maybe this is the instrument equivalent of our reconstructions of the manuscript sketches where you're missing all the ornaments and the base and everything and you have to invent something to fit, to fit it in. And then he says the true copy or exact copy should only be used when the instrument maker has tried to recreate a historical object in every detail. It's a legitimate goal, but it's always based on dated knowledge. So this is quite judgmental, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that we, I'm not, I'm not sure I like the attitude. But you can see that there's something thinking here that you can try and make, you can try and copy exactly every detail of an original, and we all know that that's not actually possible because you can't make an exact <coughs> copy of anything because on on the micro detail, detail it's going to be different. And then he says the counterfeit. And that's an interesting idea. We don't really have, well, we think we don't have it. This is when a person tries to make a new harp, but they pretend it's an old one. They think of super successful counterfeit. So we go into the museum and we look at these harps and say, yeah, this one is 18th century. How do you know it's not a Victorian fake? Because that's what a counterfeit is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
In, a, in actual fact, counterfeits are quite easy to spot because when they're brand new, they look exactly right. And 20 years later, you look at them and you think, that looks so 80s. Okay. <laughs> How could anyone ever fall for it? So counterfeits are very interesting, but we don't usually have to deal with that. But you do in some other areas, like in harpsichords, in violins, counterfeiting is everywhere. So I thought, I, I just thought, these are things to think about. How do, what do we mean by a copy? There's a whole load of different types of object that we might call a copy, or a replica, or a reproduction, or a reconstruction. And every word is nuanced and has implications. And I, I, I just like to be very careful with using these words. And you have to use a word that has implications, <coughs> etc. And one of the things that interests me is the whole aesthetics of the instrument, because aesthetic choices affect the way the instrument is made and presented and decorated. And there's an extent to which a lot of modern cops, copies are not given as much decoration as the historical originals, or are given more decoration, or a different style of decoration. And I wonder how much the decoration is important in the experience of the reproduction or replica instrument. Because, because the decoration is like an intrinsic part of it. It's, and, and this photograph of the, of the original Queen Mary harp in the museum is meant to show that, that when you sit in a harp, this detail here is what's in front of you. And your experience of sitting at the harp is strongly affected by that. I've never sat, actually sat at Queen Mary Harp because it's in a glass uh, Mary Rowland would have experienced this. But I have this on my harp. If you look inside the four pillar, the most detailed area of decoration is up the inside. And it's worth just sitting with this harp for a second and looking at that and thinking, how does this affect your perception of what this object is? And how does that perception affect the music that you play? If this harp was functionally identical and made of clear perspex, your mindset when sitting at it would be very different from a hand-carved, painted, decorated object. And so the instrument maker not only do they provide an acoustical tool, they provide a kind of psychedelic, mind-altering tool, because the act of sitting at it, touching it, feeling it, looking at it, changes your mindset. And I, and I became very fascinated by that idea, that it's no good just having an instrument that makes the right noises when you're trying in the right places. The, the whole experience is, a kind of, is an important thing. And a new piece of work that I've been doing recently connected to that is tuning pins. When, um, when Pedro was making my new harp, we talked a little bit about tuning pins, and I said, oh, I would make the tuning pins, because I enjoy little bits of metal work and contributing. And I started making pins, and I thought, it's not quite right. And so I did put a lot of time in to try and make better tuning pins. So the tuning pins on this harp have these enormous decorated filed brass ends copying the originals. And who are the people who've been playing the, stu the, the simplified student versions of this harp? There's two of them in the room. There should be. Who, who was playing the, the come to the come to the front? Okay. Come to the front, sit, sit, on, sit on Barbara's seat, oh, okay. kick her off. <laughs> <laughs> so you should be fairly familiar with this harp. Yeah. What's your instant, to, to, so put your hands on the strings, don't make a noise, put your hands on the strings, what do you instantly feel? It's heavy. Yeah, but what do you, what do you see? Yeah, why did your, why did your face, there's this huge tangle of metal. Yeah, right? I see. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So, but do, do, they, do, they, do they prevent you seeing what's going on? Or, yeah, they, yeah. They kind of, they kind of, they kind of like this maybe. in your face. They're a little bit disturbing. Yeah. Isn't it? And I thought, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. 
but they're so much bigger than the modern pins that are used on the student instruments. Yeah, I also feel a little bit like yeah. <laughs> but isn't that interesting? That's a real ergonomic difference. Anybody else we want to try this? Anybody? Someone playing on the left shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quick, quick, quick. We can't, we can't sit for five minutes wishing we had have a go. <laughs> it's like the first thing I can say, and it's like I was not seeing the same thing. Yep, thanks, thanks. I'm just going to see if you do the movie.
illustrations are not realistic. And they don't tell us very much about ergonomics and posture. I mean, he's sitting on the floor, but is that because that's a picture of performance practice, or is that because this is a scurrilous cartoon that's trying to show everything that's hideously debased about Irish life and society? So, so I don't. That when you get early, and this is, you know, this is a 16th century picture. You can't tell much about performance practice. And you saw in my talk last night with the medieval stones. You really can't use them as evidence for ergonomics, hand position. No. But as time goes on, portraits become a more realistic genre. Oops, I'm pressing too much. Stop. So this is a 17th century portrait. And you look at it, and you can kind of imagine those people actually sitting there. You can imagine that the, it's not a photograph, but you know, you can imagine that the tableau. And yet, this is obviously an artistic composition. Look at the lines. Look at the line of the heart and the viol, and the lute, and the flute. The artist is being very clever here. The, the, the group of musicians didn't actually sit with their instruments all lined up in that beautiful line like that. This is, the artist is adjusting things. So you could think about, look at the way he's tilting the harp on its side. But you could also say, did the artist get the harp? To dare not to line up with the viol. So do you see what I mean? It's, you start to say things, but it's not become certain. It's not really until the 18th century that you have portraits that, in the sense that we understand them nowadays, I think. And even then, there are problems. So the, port the famous portrait of Caroline is fairly clear. You can, see, you, can see, you can see his blind eyes looking up. You can see the, the, the droop of his shoulder and his arm. You can see him resting his hand on the harp, a little bit like Mary Rowland was saying. You can just about see the green sleeve of his right arm drooping right down onto the base of the harp. And yet the shape of the harp seems strangely distorted. You know, you can count the pins. There's only about four or five pins in the treble of the harp. It's not, it's not been done right. There's something, there's something distorted about it. It's like the artist is compressing the heart to fit in the frame. And as soon as you have that, you start to wonder. But you can think. Um, you can think. Does this, tell, this, must, this tells us something about Caroline and his posture and his attitude at the heart. And we can start to think about what he's doing. And that attitude teaches us something about what our attitude might be. We might want to be, we might want to be influenced by Caroline. And studying the portrait gives us a little bit of a, you know, we might want to be influenced by Roland Brown. And so sitting, having him, he said, he said oh, look on YouTube, you'll, you'll be able to hear all my stuff there. But it's different to, to see him preparing and playing, and that can influence us. And so looking at the portrait of Caroline can influence us and make us think, how do you sit? How do you? Interesting. This one looks even more realistic. You know, if lo lots of detail of the drapery, and yet, look at the poses of the people. You know, it's, it's very staged. Look at the fingers pointing from there, and the head to one side. And this girl is holding a manuscript picking out music and pointing at the harp. And he's got his hands on the harp, but do you see what I mean? There's, a, there's still an element of staged artificiality about this. The, the portrait is not trying to show what the family looks like when they sit down for a music session. The portrait is trying to project staged, dramatic, messages of relationship and status and importance. And so you have to decode those messages before you can say anything about his performance practice and how he played the harp. The 
The portraits of the tradition bearers can be very interesting because these, towards the end of the 18th century, are less trying to, these are not commissioned portraits trying to project an image of status and power like the previous one is. These are sketches to record what the person looked like. And I think they're recording what the person looked like with their heart in a more natural way. The flip side of that is that some of them are really not very good. But I found that there was a previously unknown portrait of the harpist William Carr, who was at the Belfast Harp Festival. Sylvia found the reference to it, and I chased up the portrait, and I was so excited, and I wrote to the to the um, Cambridge College that has the manuscript, and they sent me the sketch, and here it is, and I just thought, <laughs> come on, can you not draw a better sketch than that? I mean, what does this tell us about Carr, and what he looked like, and how he held his heart? It's just hopeless. So, so th there's a different problem once you get to these sketches of, of the tradition bearers. Um, but you start to look and you start to think, look, you can see his hand in the heart. You can look at the shape of his thumb. You can see how his fingers are bent. And you can look at his base hand. His thumb is up. His, index, his first finger, his, so his first, first finger is thumb. Number one is up. Number two is bent down. Number three is stretched out a little bit. Number four is reaching down. And number five is off. And look at his treble hand. Number one is up. Number two is hooked, number three is on the next string, number four, number five. You can start to think what shape his hands are and how the, how the hand position works on the harp. So, and yet they're still rubbery fingers, so I'm not sure how that works. This is Arthur O'Neill. There are harps that are said to be Arthur O'Neill's, but not this one in his portraits. And you can see it's very distinctive with the scroll. And so the nearest to this harp that we have in the room is again the Caroline harp. And so we use it as a stand-in, acknowledging that this is not a perfect match. And so what we can do is we can start to think, okay, Arthur O'Neill is a really important tradition bearer for us, and we want to be influenced by him. So we can try and copy his posture and his way of holding the heart. So I would like a volunteer to come and be Arthur O'Neill. Yes. <laughs> if, if nobody volunteers, then we sit here looking at each other for 10 minutes instead of working on so, well, so, so what we're to do is we're to kind of instruct, or well, how about, yeah, no, how about, so slowly and carefully and think, and we don't want any noises, because this is experiential and thoughtful, but didn't anybody say, so you can see, David's posture, and I can't because I'm standing here. But does anyone have anything? What's different? The right hand has lower down. Right, so David, take your right hand yes. and lower down. Okay. Can I press it? Yeah. What else? The top of the hand is much thicker. Look at his hands. The top of the hand is thicker. In what direction? Well, you can't see the width of his heart because well, I can see the width of his heart. Yeah, but that's yeah. That, that changes your posture. Look at the shape of his hands. Look at his left hand. It's kind of like this, isn't it? So, so curl your finger, curl your fingers down like that. So I mean, it's, okay. It's kind of strange, isn't it? And what about the right hand? Look how he's got. It's like this. So look in this fingers. Okay. Stretch these two. Like right. that, yeah. I would also say something about the, the, the relationship of the head with yeah, the Yeah, so what's his head doing? It's almost resting on the yeah. head. But it's, it's he's looking very, well, looking. His head is pointing forward. Yeah. It's very nestled, sort of, yeah. inside the mark. Yeah. It's looking straight forward. You'd wonder, was he to keep an eye on the screen? So. But he's not. He's not. He's sitting very straight. 
Yeah, look at the shape of his shoulders. What was David's shoulders like? Yeah? He's, he's not hunched over, but no, but he's... Yeah, but it's like quite... Thank you, David. Right. Right. Another, another to try and be after a meal. Arthur is such a And I have to say at once that this is actually quite difficult to do for two reasons. One is because it's quite difficult to copy the shapes. And another is because these are not photographs, these are sketches, and so everything's distorted and gone a bit wrong. And so you're kind of trying to copy an impossible thing. So, um, more, I don't look at the screen, but other people look at the screen and tell me what to do. I think this is a more useful way of working. So, um, left hand fingers, I think they should be more like this angle, shouldn't they? It's, it's really strange the way he's. The way his hand is up like this. Maybe it's he's, he has his thumb like nice and then the rest just or down like that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. like this, yeah. almost closed. Oh, almost I wonder about the head and the shoulders. Well, the shoulders are way more forward because. Yeah, so, so really more, you're not hunching over yeah. enough. Hunching over enough. Yeah. Well, but what, the and then they're instantly. Sorry, go on. The sp string spacing of the actual instrument is way wider so that it makes that you have to. Yeah, and so, yeah. And so, we, and so now, this, that's a very interesting comment because now we want to get up against the problem that this half is not actually the half in the portrait. Yeah. And so there's a limit to how far we can take this exercise. This arm looks really, really long, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we have to yeah. make this some arm distortion. Because <laughs> <laughs> it should be kind of resting on my yeah. yeah. Well, the, the thing that I notice is that his foot is, his foot's just about the front. Oh yeah. So that's yeah, why yeah. I kind of put it up higher. Yeah. If you have it down like this, that's yeah. This is the thing I find about these portraits is that every time you look, yeah. you see another little detail. So I've forgotten about the foot. Yeah. But and do you see what I mean? There's so much adjustment you can make to your Sorry, excuse me, uh, about the length of the arms. I remember being in a museum once and seeing eighteenth century uniforms and the arms did seem to be longer and thinner. Yeah. People are, people are different shapes. That's the other thing. Yeah. Warwick is not the same stature yeah. as David. Yeah. And so neither of them, they can't both be the same stature as Arthur and Neil. So yeah. there's an issue there as well. Okay, here's the portrait of Charles Byrne. And I've put up beside the Muller Mast Hub, which seems to be at least at least a very similar instrument, if not the same instrument. I'm not certain about this. Michael has studied it and is pretty certain, I think. Pretty certain. Yeah. So you can you can at least see that it's the same design of the instrument, it's the same kind of size and everything. I also have a slight question about whether this is actually Charles Byrne or not, because the attribution only comes from 1911. And we don't. Have you ever seen the original? Do you want to see the original? They don't seem to have it. No, I, I think it's not in Queens. It was asked to go back to the family. It was asked to go back to the family. She no. returned it. She, she, you can read her character, right? Yeah. She was very formal, mm -hmm. very violent, look, very. Sort of this is Charlotte Milligan Fox in 1911, yes. yes. And she had got that, and she had seen the request. Please can Please you return, return it to the family. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's gone fast. So you won't find it, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, the family, the places that re became a, a whole century ago, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. you won't find it now. So but she, it would have been written on the back, the way they always yeah. find so it. So we, we, we assume that this portraits. is a transcript was what was written of the, the caption on the back of the picture. Yeah. yeah. But you know, without inspecting the original, you can't. No, they're not. And there's a lot of that kind of thing, you know. There's a lot of things that you just think, if only. But, yes. you, but it is what it is, and we have to use it. You can't write it off because of that. The other thing, so I'm going to confirm what you were just saying about yes. the size. I scaled that up, and if you look at Charles Byrne and you look at the mother, bearing in mind that that, you know, as I said, that the block had been cut short, mm. so this is actually taller. He was a very small one. Time man. And of course, the other thing is, of course, we, we look around, but I mean, I have to live in a 200 year old house, right? And there are doors at this time. Yeah. Some yeah. years ago, I went up back with the band and Margaret up to Green Hall, and there was one old house with a long terrace, yeah. terrace of the police, but they both had the, these rain. Yeah. Yeah. There's one old house that's still there. And 
You could stand up straight. Oh, yeah, yeah, you hear your head. Excuse me. Just get slightly. The leaf is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do we do forget? We're poor, we're poor um, nutrition people are very much. So do we, do we have a short volunteer to be Charles Byrne? Constance. <laughs> so again, I want, I want you to I, not necessarily look at the picture because I want you to be Charles Byrne. So, so we'll instruct you to sit down and take the heart. On the edge of the chair. Okay. So, okay, Barbara says, very good, on the edge of the chair. <laughs> is, the chair, is the chair the right height? Look at the angle of the legs there. You see, that's the other thing. Feet. Feet where are the feet? So feet feet the right. 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 forward, yeah. What about the angle of the heart? Yeah, so we need to tuck the heart right in like that. Yeah, but then it will just fall forward. Well, you need to hold it, maybe? Yeah, it looks like it's holding with the Right. It's yeah. pressed, it. that, that's not yeah. a way I'm off. Yeah. Okay. Hands? Left hand is really good. Left hand really up, right and up. up and curling round, right yeah? And right hand? Look at the shape of the right hand, it's like this. Yeah. yeah. Almost. Yeah. Index yeah. finger hook. It's yeah. not far it's not enough. Enough. But look how close the hand is to the same yeah. board. Yeah. Both hands, really close in. Yeah. Like it's to do with clutching the heart back towards you. Yeah. yeah. And the hairstyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not bad for a 90 year old, isn't it? Yeah, the lips look silent, the foot. That was what I was like, the foot. Yeah, it was cut. So you think the foot was already cut? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Because I eventually had part of the block taken away, which was actually a heavy weight yeah, going on yeah. that anyway. Because uh, there was cracks coming. Yeah. And uh, when, you, when you, you could see it'd be cut and this oak base had been put on, you could see the oak base, you see it curls yeah, around yeah, yeah. in the front. Mm -hmm. You know, then there's no other heart like that. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank maybe, you. Maybe the foot was actually sacrificial, you know, like they had this on boats, you know, yeah. just to put on to yeah. work away. Yeah. I was talking to an antique furniture man, he said uh, about why chairs were so low, and he said often you would, in the trade, they cut the length of the chairs when they get woodwork. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right so yeah, there's all kinds of possibilities. But actually, I'm less interested from this point of view in those explanations as to why a thing was done. I want, I want to, we're talking about the experience of using the thing, you know. So, oh, and the ham. Sorry, I forgot this one. Okay, Dennis a ham scene, and there he is with the downhill heart. We'll see in Genesis. So, do we have a volunteer to be Dennis and Hamsey? Jim, yeah. have you come? We should turn no. the chair around first. Oh, yeah, very good. Excellent. Brilliant. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. I, it's just that I'm so used to looking at the hop like this one and playing. I, I don't know whether you could see the hop, would you? We would join the Yeah, that's a good point. So, so the 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 was was yeah. was old Hamsey blind? Yes, yes. yes. Then he he, 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 could, he had yeah. this extra sensory thing. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. He also yeah. had a very he had a very large yeah. 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 head, which is why the hat. The hat. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there's yeah. another picture. Yeah. See if I hide that hat. Yeah. 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 That yeah. must have weighed a lot. It also yeah. meant that he had to rest his chair because of the wind. Yeah. 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 Another volunteer to be the Lisa Hampsey. Yeah. 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 Oh, I was saying oh. that resting on it feels mm -hmm. so resonant to the sound of the yes. directly. Yes. Oh. Okay. okay, so no hat, but then might. Okay, um, I think Dennis is sitting a bit further forward on the chair than that. Okay. Yeah, like that. It's worth it's worth going home and trying this, except you have to have a collection of hearts. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> so so vi visit visit your local heart maker and place an order now. You have to get a special chair as well. So the chin ball and the hunch curl it back over. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And ruffle face. <laughs> but, it, but it gives you a, it gives you a, a different experience of the heart, doesn't it, yeah. to do this. Uh, Paul, I'm, elbow to wrist is parallel with the floor and your left arm. Yeah, your left arm needs to be dropped down to here, doesn't it? That's it. And doesn't your right arm oh. need to be lower as well, like that? So if he does that parallel, then this and is lower down. down needs to be yeah. Ah. So does Dennis have to have short arms? No, but it I, looks I like found a letter nice. from Edward Bunting um, in the Linen Hall Library where he discusses this portrait. And he said, yeah, some of this it will be really difficult for the engraver, so I've changed it. Oh. Oh. At the same time, it looks like his elbow is going I don't know what he's talking about. Is he talking about cross hatchings and textures? Or is he talking about. <laughs> and so, so that, this is really important to remember as well. There's a limit to how much you can trust yeah. these things. Yeah. One thing that struck me is the heart actually does look quite big compared to healthy. Yeah, so I think he's a small man. I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I keep forgetting the hands. Yeah. I think I read that finial come, used to come off or something. The, the finial of the heart, because you know, does it match the picture? Yeah, I think there's an easy answer to that. When, when you go to the Maybe museum, you in his pocket when you go to the museum, something? there's a big glue joint yeah. right here. Yeah, and then it came off, and you put it in his yeah. pocket, yeah. right? Or something. But it's, I mean, it's clearly original, but it's been glued on. And on the right. portrait, just here, it's not there. Right. And in the other portrait, you can see the jagged splinter yeah. edges of the wood. So. So but he must have kept it, because yeah, it's I fixed back on. I think he put it in his pocket or something. Yeah. So what, what year would that be? What year that would be? Well, he died in 1809 is the date of the engraving. Yeah. OK, so this is the portrait of Patrick Quinn, sitting with the Artway heart. And I've left this one last because this is clearly the most accurate and realistic portrait of any of the old harpers. And I think one of the ways you can see that is by comparing the portrait of the harp with the real harp. Mm -hmm. yeah, what about William Archie? Yeah. I just think that's really... No, because, that, because he's projecting his baroque gesture and everything, so it's not a realistic portrait of... Well, it, it, are you saying it might not be? Because yeah. it could be a realistic portrait. Yeah. I don't have any problem with that. With? With the stage. Yeah, it just looks really yeah. solid. I think he looks very comfortable. Yeah. Okay, the other thing is, is that I'm thinking of the group of 18th century tradition bearers. Well, yes, so, sorry, so I should have qualified for that. Yes, yes, yeah. yes absolutely. Mm -hmm. So compared to a Hampsey or William Carr or Arthur O'Neill or any of that, this portrait is a, is a whole step up. So. So we don't have a copy of the Otway Harp here. And I've never seen a good copy of it. But we do have courtiers, very simple, <laughs> quick and dirty, simplified ones. And so does anybody want to come and be Patrick Quinn? I could be Patrick Quinn. You've already had a go. So who hasn't had a go? <laughs> 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 I think the 
So, so, so this, yeah. this, this half is not exactly the same shape and size as the, as the Castle Hotway half. We're, so we're back in Arthur O'Neill territory. We're approximating, but, it, but we can use it as a kind of, we can, we can still do the work, we just have slightly more difficulty. So, yes, height of, height of chair. Yeah, I think the chair is too high. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, look, his thigh is always yeah. yeah. Can we try and run his little stool? This one is too short. Actually, look at, look at the level of her head yeah. to the top of the heart. Yeah. So this is going to work. Do you think his heart, the soundboard is more like, uh, vertical? Like, yeah. 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 Okay, so Rachel says, yeah, tuck the bottom of the heart in closer to you. Tuck it right in. Yeah. 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 And do you think his thigh is, is, is holding the box up in four? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, because look, he's, he's hooked his. Mm -hmm. It, and on the inside of your knee here, there's a little bony knot, and you can hook that part behind that, and that clutches the half to you. And especially if his wrist is on the soundboard, this wrist is on. It's like he's clamping the half against himself. the foot is turned as well. It's yeah, 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 yeah. And we can't see what he's doing with his other knee, which is a shame. But, but yes, he's, he's, he's drawing the half in like this, and really pulling it to himself. And look at his head. He's blind, so he doesn't need to look. But this is your thing that you mentioned. He's yeah. like setting his all his cheekbones against the root of the heart, yeah. so, so the resonance comes right up into yeah. him. And his right hand looks like it's really resting on his leg. Yeah, his right, yeah, right yeah. hand down on the yeah. leg. Yeah. Or like this part, this fire. part of his, of his arm. Oh yeah, the arm. Yeah, the arm. Yeah, not not this part. Yeah. This part yeah. on the leg. Yeah. And the shape of his right hand, with his thumb up, and his first finger in. And his middle finger bent, and his fourth finger straight, and his pinky just curled a bit under, and his left hand with Sylvia's gap and thumb up like this. If he's squinting, he'll be a fighter. <laughs> Why did you say that? Just he's, look, he's looking down like this. He's got, you know, you do you do the the chandra yeah. on your leg? Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's that's very interesting because. <laughs> Because it just gives you another visceral sense of how the musician holds themselves, how they experience the music. What about the wear marks? Then you're mentioning the words were the marks. So on, on the hot way half, yeah, there's there's wear down the side, there's wear at the bottom. I think it matches. It, it can probably much older than Queen, though. That, that wear is considerably it's, 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 it's a lot of wear, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's a lot of people yeah. playing that. But on the other hand, the tradition is conservative. The half remains the same size. You're going to have to kind of hold it in the same way to make it work, so it's no surprise. William talked about wear on his pipes. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing. It's worth looking at when we're in the museum. Anyway, anyway we should stop. Questions. So, time for a question. Yes. Um, uh, this is uh, three points I'd like to make. It's the yeah. the zeal of the newly converted, yeah, yeah. rather than any knowledge. Go for it. Um, number one, I was at a, a conference in Japan years ago, but at least 20 years ago, and we had this big, well, for the, like, the planning committee, which I was sort of associated with. A big banquet, you see, and everybody sat on the floor, mm -hmm. and there were tables roughly the height of that stool. Two mm -hmm. tables yes. were about this height, mm -hmm. and it was excruciating to sit like a table. But for you, you but not for them. Not for them. Mm -hmm. And eventually, they brought in for us the backs of chairs mm -hmm. with no legs, yes. and then we were able to put our legs out mm -hmm. straight and sit. Yeah. But if you imagine. You know the first picture that you yes. showed? I've often wondered if everybody was sitting on the floor, on the ground, in that. Yes. Maybe. That's point yeah. number one. Um, point number two is um, the difficulty an artist would have of drawing a harp if they might not see it very often. I mean, do you draw? No, Mr. Your work is difficult. Have you seen that? Yeah. Even in a good portrait, the half gets a bit wobbly. I'm not very good at the train as an architect. Yes. And the first thing you do is you get the main lines yeah. of your thing. 
while it's still there yes. and before the person moves. Mm -hmm. And maybe that drawing from the Cambridge College that struck me, yeah. maybe that's actually a highly yeah. accurate, yeah. almost yes. almost a photograph of an yes. instant. You know? It's his travel and diary. Every day he every day he writes what he's done and he draws a sketch of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and that therefore might actually be far more accurate than one suspects. Yeah. And then later on it's easy to fill in human physiology and stuff as well, but what people look at. Yes. But, but, but you can't so fill it in half. Yeah, yeah. And then you could extrapolate that no harp thing to all uh, illustrations of people with harps. Yes. They, they, the artist always has the same problem. There's no harp to draw anymore, and they don't understand how harps work yes. even. I and in order to make it, I'm sorry, I've just almost finished. In order to make a good drawing, of any sort of structure, or you know those funny bridges by the um, Calatrava, yes. you know, you actually have to understand the structures. That's the, that's one of the great values of this portrait mm -hmm. because you can compare every detail from court to how uh, he's got the little tiny <coughs> glints of the nails yeah. and the metroid yeah. just right. Yeah. On the original, you can see the lines of decoration up here. You know, he's, fact, you, yeah, you can see the little. Flower of the same So the point, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Connell. Connell. The point Connell made about the sketch is so true because if you remember before that one was discovered, what was the one we were looking at? The focus engraving. Yeah. Monster of a heart. Yes. Big thing yeah. never worked. And yet, it's come from the same early sketch that Mr. Mm -hmm. Potter did. And that's the finished item. Yeah. And that sketch that the focus used was just at the head and just. Yeah, and the the rest heart, was invented. which exactly fits in with what you're saying. Yeah. But but I don't want to despair and say therefore we can't use the um, the portraits to inform us because they're imperfect, incomplete, distorted. Yeah. But they're what we have. But this combination, of the portrait and the <coughs> accurate, detailed, decorated, handmade replica art. This is a combination that I think has a huge amount of scope for us to use to develop our own practice in rediscovering this tradition. That's it. We're done.